Well, good morning and welcome to Sunday School here at Shenandoah Baptist Church. We are in the book of 1 Samuel in chapter number 14. It's a long chapter. We've been going through various uh, stories within this chapter, but just as a quick review for you to remember where we are, uh, in chapter 13, Saul chose out 3,000 men. The Philistines heard about this, gathered themselves together against Israel. Saul feared, Israel feared. Many went and hid themselves in caves. And uh, Saul get, tried to gather together the army, but while he was waiting for Samuel to arrive, people were leaving and going home or hiding and because they were afraid of what the Philistines would do. Saul, seeing that his army was slowly leaving, decides to go ahead without Samuel, offer the burnt offering. Samuel arrives as soon as Saul has done this and uh, basically says, what have you done, Saul? And uh, Saul tells him and tries to convince him he had no other choice. Uh, that he was forced to do it, but Samuel knows better. God knows better uh, that this was uh, a disrespect uh, on Saul's part of God. And, and Saul trying to uh, recognize his own authority here instead of God's authority. And Samuel uh, basically tells Saul, uh, your reign is going to come to an end. Your children are not going not to reign in your place. God is going to choose somebody else. In chapter number 14, we're still at the Philistines and camped outside, and, and Jonathan is determined he is going to step up and do something. And so he and his armor bearer uh, go up to a garrison of the Philistines, and they climbed up on their hands and feet because it's so steep, and they reveal themselves uh, to the Philistines, and they leave it up to the Lord and the Philistines what's going to happen next. And the Philistines said, come on up here and we'll show you something. We're going to teach you something. Uh, and thinking that they would hear toy with this Israelite, it turns out to be very different. Um, Jonathan and his armor bearer killed at least 20 of the soldiers there in a half acre of land. And that caused everyone else to fear as they stood back and watched or as the story spread throughout the camp. And as a result of that one action, one man and his armor bearer stepping up and saying, you know what, the Lord can use many and the Lord can use few and we're few. And so we're going to step up and do something. Our army is paralyzed in fear. Even my father is paralyzed in fear, the king. So I'm going to step up and show the people of Israel and the Philistines what God can do with just one consecrated, dedicated, faithful soldier. And uh, it, it spread fear throughout all the Philistines, in so much so that it, it had caused confusion. They began to attack one another. Uh, Saul heard the roar of battle and was very confused and said, Go and find out who's missing from our camp. Somebody must have gone and caused a battle. Uh, and they came back and said, it's Jonathan and his armor bearer. They're gone. Uh, and of course, Saul was upset about this. And his next act is to get the Ark of the Covenant and bring it to the battle. But while he was talking to the priest, the, the roar of the battle grew even louder. And messengers came and said that they were fighting one another. And Saul instead gathered his, his army together. I don't know how many he still has, maybe 600. And marches down to the battle and looks on at the mass chaos and confusion and joins in the battle. All of Israel comes out of their holes and joins into the battle. Uh, why? Because one man, one faithful man stood up. Uh, one faithful man went out to battle and God worked mightily through him and it encouraged the rest of Israel. So we're in chapter number 14. Uh, we get to, to verse number 24. Here we have a great victory that is happening. A great victory that is going to be overshadowed by Saul's unwise decision. It says in verse number 24 of 1 Samuel 14, And the men of Israel were distressed that day, for Saul had adjured the people, saying, Cursed be the man that eateth any food until evening, that I may be avenged on mine enemies. So none of the people tasted any food. And all they of the land came to a wood, and there was honey upon the ground. And we'll pause there for a second before we move on. In verse number 24, Saul makes a vowel. He makes a vow. Why is he making this vow? Uh, Saul here wants to be the head honcho, wants to be the guy in charge, and he wants to have revenge upon his enemies. And so nobody's allowed to eat. Why? Well, I don't want anybody to rest or sit down until we have destroyed the Philistines. This is probably more so the purpose of why he's done this. I don't want anybody to eat or rest or sit down until I've avenged myself on the Philistines. Well, it takes an incredible amount of energy to fight. We discussed this last Sunday. It takes an incredible amount of energy to fight for one straight minute, for 60 seconds. 
let alone for an entire day. So to not allow your army to replenish their nutrients, the, fu the fuel that they need, that's crazy, that's insane. No commander in his right mind, <laughs> in his right mind, is going to allow that to happen. You need to refuel your men. Otherwise, they'll lose energy, will to fight, will to go on. Anyways, he said, Cursed be the man that eateth any food until evening. And the people listened. Well, most of them. Says they, they, they of the land came to a wood, and there was honey upon the ground. And when the people were come into the wood, behold, the honey dropped. But no man put his hand to his mouth, for the people feared the oath. They saw the honey, and boy, the sweetness, the sugar, that honey, it would refresh them, replenish their strength. And sometimes, if you're like me, sometimes you just need a little bit of sugar, something to just kind of lift you back up again and get you through the remainder of what it is you're trying to accomplish. And boy, I tell you what, after using up all of that energy that they have, they could have definitely used some replenishment. They saw it, but they wouldn't touch it. They wouldn't take something that was going to be good for them, something that was going to help them complete the battle. Instead, their commander had hindered them. Their commander had hawked them like, like a horse, a battle horse would be hawked, and the tendons being cut so that it could not walk or run anymore. Verse 27, But Jonathan heard not when his father charged the people with the oath. Wherefore, he put forth the end of the rod that was in his hand and dipped it in a honeycomb and put his hand to his mouth. And his eyes were enlightened. Then answered one of the people and said, Thy father straightly charged the people with an oath, saying, Cursed be the man that eateth any food this day. And the people were faint. Jonathan apparently didn't hear this message. Why? Well, because Jonathan was out fighting the battle for his dad. Jonathan was out... Um, having the hand of God upon him being used. Jonathan was out working while his dad was back in camp cowering. That's why he didn't hear. That's why he didn't hear his father's very foolish error. And that's why this victory of God's, this victory of Jonathan's, is going to be very greatly overshadowed by Saul's error. Say, or, or Jonathan never heard this, so he ate. The people quickly told him, hey, your father made a vow. Uh, your father made this decision. Well, look what Jonathan determines. Look what he says. I think it's important to note this. I think Jonathan was much more a man of integrity than his father. That Jonathan had more faith in God than his father did. Verse 29, Then said Jonathan, my father hath troubled the land. See, I pray you, how mine eyes have been enlightened, because I tasted a little of this honey. How much more, if haply the people had eaten freely today of the spoil of their enemies, which they found. For had there not been now a much greater slaughter among the Philistines? Jo Jonathan makes this ob observation. The king is a trouble to the people. The king is being troublesome right now. He's bothering the people. He's hindering the people. And in fact, in an attempt to make the battle uh, more, uh, more of an effect against the Philistines, he's actually made it easier on the Philistines because the army was faint and it could not chase. It could not chase down the enemy. It could no longer fight. And so Saul had actually undone that which he was trying to accomplish. Jonathan doesn't just automatically agree. Jonathan realizes he's able to see through eyes that are not yet gilded like his father's. With the, the, the guilt of pride, of position as king, of selfishness and the desire of respect for himself above respect of God. And Jonathan acknowledges this. But what happens here as a result of Saul's grievous error, of Saul's misjudgment, of Saul's wrong decision that affects so many other people. Well, what happens? The people go on all day without food. Now, if you're anything like me and you're ravenously hungry, um, just about anything sounds pretty good. I think of times when I was hiking and we would go on two, three-day hikes uh, when I was a kid and 
Uh, I went with my, my teacher from fifth and sixth grade, and there would be things that I would eat on that hike that I would never eat anywhere else. Uh, for example, and this is going to sound crazy, but stick with me on this. I've only eaten a peanut butter and jelly sandwich one time in my life, and it was on that hike, and it was good, but I've never tried one again. Uh, I didn't like instant oatmeal until I was on that hike. I remember, lo I remember he got, uh, my teacher, he found some ramps, which are some wild onions, very um, potent onions, that is, and he cut up some ramps and put it in some ramen noodles and then some venison steak that he brought with him and stuck it in there and cooked it. And I'll tell you something, that I have never tasted food that tasted as good as that in my entire life, I think. And it wasn't anything special, it was just ramen and, and wild onions and some deer steaks, cube steak that he had brought with him. But tell you, it was good. Why? Because I was hungry. Because I had been hiking for hours all day long. I was ravenous. I would have eaten the bark off a tree, I think. And Israel finds themselves in a situation where they are ravenously hungry, they are fainting, they're about to fall over, and now they have the spoils of war in front of them. Cattle, meat of all types that are still alive and running around, of course, sheep, goats, who knows? All kinds of things. And boy, look at the food walking around. It still has fur and legs on it, but you know what? It's food, and Israel... As hungry as they were, make some very foolish mistakes. Well, let's read verse number 31. And they smote the Philistines that day from Michmash to Ajalon, and the people were very faint. It says, and the people flew upon the spoil. Flew upon the spoil. They could not get there fast enough because they were starving. They took sheep, oxen, calves. It says they slew them on the ground, and the people did eat them with the blood. This is against what God has commanded Israel to do. They are to not eat meat with the blood in it. This is something that uh, the pagans would do. No, we don't eat raw meat. This is, what not, this is not what Israel was supposed to do. You don't eat raw meat. You drain the blood out of it, and then you cook the meat. But Israel here is sinning against God. Now, can I say that Saul was directly what caused them to sin? Well, no. Not exactly. But I think Saul had a big part in it. Because to the eyes of Israel, their king, the man they looked up to, had determined that I can bend God's rules when and how I want it because I am king and it's okay. I wonder if the people knew about what Samuel had said to Saul when he told him that the kingdom would no longer be his. I have a feeling the people did not know. And so they still looked up to Saul and they thought, well, the king determines he can bend God's rules. And so they, in, the, in, in turn, bent God's rules. While we're starving, we're hungry, we don't have time to, to butcher this meat and to cook it. We have to eat now, and they bent God's rules. You know, that's one reason why, as parents, we must be very careful. As parents, as grandparents... You must still have your children, grandchildren, students in Sunday school or students in school must see that you take very seriously the Word of God and its preaching and church. That you don't view it lightly because as lightly as you take it, they will take it that much more lightly. As much as we feel we can bend God's rules, our children will go that much further away from God's rules. And the people that Saul were leading went that much further. Somebody told Saul about it. Verse number 33. Then they told Saul, saying, Behold, the people sin against the Lord, in that they eat with the blood. And he said, You have transgressed. Roll a great stone unto me this day. Saul, who are you to make this statement? He heard that the people were eating animals, they're killing them and eating them raw. And he says, you have transgressed. Roll a great stone unto me this day. And Saul said, disperse yourselves among the people and say unto them, bring me hither every man his ox and every man his sheep and slay them here and eat and sin not against the Lord in eating with the blood. And all the people brought every man his ox with him that night and slew them there. And Saul built an altar unto the Lord. The same was the first altar that he built unto the Lord. Saul hears 
has the gall to be, be upset with the people for disobeying God and says, bring me a stone and we'll use this. We'll use this. This is where you'll slay them and you'll drain their blood and then you can cook them and eat them and then we'll be doing it the right way, says King Saul. And so everybody did. They obeyed what Saul had said to do. And then in verse 36, Saul said, Let us go down after the Philistines by night and spoil them until the morning light and let us not leave a man of them. So they said, let's go down in the middle of the night. We'll surprise attack the ones that are left. We'll kill anybody we find and take anything we can find too. And they said, do whatsoever seemeth good unto thee. Then said the priest, let us draw near hither unto God. The priest said, well, let's ask God about this. Saul has plans. Let's go down and try to finish the Philistines off. The people said, well, anything you say, Saul, anything you say, we love you, Saul. And the priest said, let's go ask God. Verse 37, and Saul asked counsel of God. Shall I go down after the Philistines? Wilt thou deliver them into the hands of Israel? But verse number 37 reveals where Saul's heart was all along. This is why we know, why I, I say, back in verse 34 and verse 33, when Saul seems to be angry because the people are uh, disobeying God, this is why I think that Saul was definitely not being genuine here. You see, Saul no longer had an open line of communication to God because rebellion in his heart because he disrespected God and God's rules and laws. He loved himself more than he loved God. He disobeyed. He had a rebellious heart. It says in verse number 37 that Saul asked God if he should go down after the Philistines, if God would deliver the Philistines into the hands of Israel. It says, but he, God, answered him not that day. The oracle of God was silent. God was not speaking to Saul. And we know that because in chapter 13, Samuel said that that was going to be the case. But can you imagine being the leader of God's people and yet God will not speak to you? God will not answer your questions or your requests. God is not going to give you insight or wisdom concerning daily activities or battles. God is not going to put His hand of blessing upon it. You are naked and alone and cold as the king of Israel, like every other king in the world. Must have been a lonely feeling for Saul. Verse 38, And Saul said, Draw ye near hither, all the chief of the people, and know and see wherein this sin hath been this day. He says, gather together the chiefs of the people and we're going to figure out who sinned. Why isn't God answering me? Who has sinned? Who's done the wrong thing that's, that's hindering God from talking to me? As we go through the, the remainder of this story, all eyes and fingers are eventually going to be on Jonathan. But was Jonathan really the one that was responsible for hindering God speaking to Saul and the people of Israel? Was Jonathan really responsible for the hand of God being removed from Israel? Well, Saul is on the warpath. He refuses to see his own guilt. He refuses to take responsibility for his own actions. And so now he's going to gather the people and torment them even further and hunt down whoever it was. And I think it's interesting the way God works this out, too. They're going to go by luck, so to speak, by uh, God choosing, uh, by casting lots here. It says in verse 39, For as the Lord liveth, this is still Saul speaking, For as the Lord liveth, which saveth Israel, though it be in Jonathan my son, he shall surely die. But there was not a man among all the people that answered him. Saul gathered everybody together, the leaders, and said, Who disobeyed my command? Who disobeyed the vow that I made? He says, So help me God, if any one of you broke this command, he'll die. If even my son Jonathan broke the command, he will die. And all of his captains, his chiefs, stand there looking at him, 
many, if not all of them, knew the answer to his question. Yeah, it was Jonathan. But none of them said a word. I think that says a lot about Jonathan and about Saul. Verse 40, Then he said unto all Israel, Be ye on one side, and I and Jonathan my son will be on the other side. And the people said unto Saul, Do what seemeth good unto thee. He's going to cast lots or draw lots again. So it's going to be between him and Jonathan and the people. And we're going to decide, is it you or was it us? Therefore Saul said unto the Lord God of Israel, Give a perfect lot. And Saul and Jonathan were taken. But the people escaped. The lot fell on Saul and Jonathan. So it wasn't the people. And Saul said, Cast lots between me and Jonathan my son. And Jonathan was taken. All eyes are now on Jonathan. And then Saul said to Jonathan, Tell me what thou hast done. And Jonathan told him and said, I did but taste a little honey with the end of the rod that was in mine hand, and lo, I must die. Let's pause there for a second. Why do you think it was that even though it was ultimately Saul who was responsible for the, the, the silence of the oracles of God, why did the lot fall on Jonathan? Well, I think Saul needed to hear Jonathan's story. I think God wanted to make sure that Saul had to face this. Now, as a father, I don't know how Saul could make the next statement. Jonathan says, yeah, I taste a little honey, and so I'm going to die. I mean, look at the humbleness of Jonathan. Jonathan thinking to himself, hey, you know what? If it were me, if, it is my, if I am the one that is causing the hand of God to be removed from Israel, then by all means, I must die. Kill me. Take my life. I'm willing to sacrifice that for the good of Israel. What a difference between son and father, between Jonathan and Saul. Verse 44, And Saul answered, God do so, and more also, for thou shalt surely die, Jonathan. No mercy, no forgiveness, no understanding. I made a vow in front of the people, and my word must be respected. And if, and if I don't follow through on Jonathan, my people aren't going to listen, and so I'll have to take my own son's life. But look what the people do. In this particular case, God speaks through the people. The people of Israel weren't going to have any of this. They watched the events. They saw King Saul cowering in his tent back at camp. They heard the story and, and heard about what Jonathan had done and about his faith in God. They weren't about to have any of this. And the people said unto Saul, I can almost imagine the shouts coming from the people up at the front, the captains maybe, Ah, oh, no, Saul, you're not going to do that. They said, Shall Jonathan die who hath wrought this great salvation in Israel? Are you really going to kill Jonathan? He's the one that caused the Philistines to be defeated. He's the one that stepped out in faith and allowed God to use him, and you're going to let him die? God forbid, as the Lord liveth, there shall not one hair of his head fall to the ground. For he hath wrought with God this day. So the people rescued Jonathan, that he died not. And that is incredible. The people rescued Jonathan, who was used by God, who, the, who was the faithful man, they rescued him from the king who was supposed to be the man of God. But he had long since turned his heart away from God and towards himself. And now he wasn't seeing or thinking clearly, and he was about to place condemnation, death, upon his son was there possibly a little bit of jealousy at play here? Jealousy that we will see present itself later against David, who is also a man of God, who is also stepping out in faith and accomplishing great things for the Lord. And Saul can't take that because God has turned his ear away from Saul. God will no longer speak with Saul or use Saul. Is there a little jealousy at play here? The people said not even one hair of his head is going to fall to the ground. You can almost see the people go and stand between him and Jonathan. Don't you dare touch this man. 
This man deserves to be celebrated, not punished. We almost sense the will of the people turn against the king as they recognize and are willing to stand up against him for this foolish vow that he made, and on top of that, the foolish decision to kill his own son. Saul is far from listening to the heart of God. He is not a man after God's own heart. After this, in verse number 46, it says, Then Saul went up from following the Philistines, and the Philistines went to their own place. We'll read later that Saul battled the Philistines throughout his entire reign, and ultimately it is in a battle with the Philistines that he dies. Saul is never able to be victorious over the Philistines. But what if? But what if Saul had not rebelled against God? What if Saul had waited on Samuel? What if Saul had uh, not turned his heart against the Lord so that the Lord still continued to speak with him? And when this battle of the Philistines came up, what if? What would have happened? What if Saul would have repented at that point when his son goes out into battle and puts him to shame and turns all of Israel against the Philistines and, and, and emboldens them to fight and we saw the Philistines on the run? What if? I don't know. But the Philistines never did stop bothering Israel. Saul never did stop fighting them until he died. David had the opportunity to pretty much wipe out the Philistines, destroy them, put a stop to them. But Saul could not because he did not have God's hand of blessing upon him. I don't want that to be the story of our church or of my family. I don't want that to be the story of your family either. Whether or not you're a mother raising the children and bringing them to church and dad doesn't care, doesn't have any interest in that whatsoever, or, or if you're a father or a grandfather. Let's not think so highly of ourselves that we disrespect God. Let's not think so highly of our own choices and decisions and wisdom and philosophies and intellect that we set it not God's wisdom, God's intellect, His decisions and choices. Because when we do so, God closes up His oracles to us he removes His hand of blessing from us, and we will never cease to see fighting in our lives. We will never see peace in our lives, so long as we fight God. And even if one of our children stand up like Jonathan did, and one of our children ex exhibits great faith, will it just cause jealousy in our heart to see them do that? Will it cause us to hate them like it caused Saul to hate David? To put them down, to dismiss them, to not want to be a part of what it is they're doing? Because we're jealous, we're put to shame by their faith. Let that not be us. Let it not be Shenandoah Baptist Church that tries to put down someone for having great faith. That tries to destroy someone because they've acted in faith for the Lord. Let it not be Shenandoah Baptist Church or any of its members that looks more highly on themselves and their own thoughts and philosophies and wisdom than they look on the thoughts and philosophies and wisdom from God's Word. Delight thyself also in the Lord. Delight thyself also in the Lord. That is important for us to do. To make Him the center of our lives the center of our desires, the center of our career, the center of our future, the center of our five-year and ten-year plan. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and He shall give thee the desires of thine heart. It's important for us, it's important for our children, and it's important for our grandchildren that we be humble before the Lord. And if we have hardened our heart in times past, let's get down on our knees and ask for forgiveness. And let's get our hearts uh, sincere and malleable to God's will once more. Let's ask for forgiveness. What if Saul had done that? Is it possible that God might have changed his mind about his decision for Saul? Sure, it's possible. God knew it wasn't going to happen, but yes, it was possible. But Saul would not repent. He was too proud. 
And let's not allow that pride, that same pride that destroyed Saul and his family to destroy you and I as well. Let's close in prayer. Dear Lord, I do thank you once more for the opportunity to gather together digitally, Lord, and to study your word and to worship you. Lord, I pray that you would soften our hearts. Lord, I allow that you would help us to deny ourselves and to take away any pride that is being a hindrance to us. And Lord, I ask for your hand of blessing upon the services today and that you would help us as we're uh, still not gathered together in church, but I ask, Lord, that you would help us to still be encouraged and faithful to your word today, Lord. I pray that you would help soften the stone in our hearts, Lord, that we have allowed to accumulate there over years. I pray that you would soften the pride that we have allowed to build. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to be sensitive to your leading so we can hear your spirit when it speaks. Lord, I pray that you would help us to encourage young folks who want to be faithful and want to stand up for the Lord. Help us to not tear them down, but instead to encourage them and help them. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to learn from this passage of Scripture. And we ask all of this in your son's name I pray. Amen.